Good evening and welcome and thank you for joining us uh, for this Book of Mormon conversation. I'm Larry Eastland, President and Chairman of the Johnny Witzel Foundation, and I'm joined by Kylie Nielsen Turley of the Neely Maxwell Institute at BYU. Kylie's written a wonderful volume on the first 29 chapters of uh, Alma for the Maxwell Institute series, The Book of Mormon Brief Theological Introductions. I've actually read it, and unfortunately, because it isn't printed yet, you haven't, so you'll get a sneak preview tonight of what it's about. And I think you'll really enjoy this. I, I thoroughly enjoyed it. The John A. Winslow Foundation is affiliated with the University of Southern California, located in one of the most religiously diverse communities in the world. Our mission as the Center for Global Latter-day Saint Scholarship and Life is to build understanding and appreciation among leaders and communities of faith throughout the world as an independent voice of the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. We invite each of you to respectfully participate in the discussion by the chat feature on the right-hand side of your screen. Also, if you have a question you'd like to ask Kylie, uh, please use the ask a question feature at the bottom of your screen or vote for your favorite question that has already been asked. We'll do our best to answer as many questions as we can during the second half of this session. Also, uh, a little bit about Kylie. She, she, this is wonderful for us. Kylie Nielsen Turley has taught writing, rhetoric, and literature since 1997 at Brigham Young University, where she emphasizes a literary approach to the Book of Mormon. She's published articles on Alma, LDS Home Literature, and Utah and LDS Women's History. She's also the author of numerous personal essays. So Kylie, welcome. We're just delighted to have you here with us tonight. Thank you. Thanks, I'm excited to be here. Tell us just a little bit about, about you and about your family as we start. Uh, well, I noticed you can see their picture back here over my shoulder for one oh, thing. Oh, yes. But that one's a little old because now I have two grandkids besides my five kids. So um, I'm in love with being a grandma. We can't forget that part. But uh, academically, I have been teaching here at BYU for a number of years, as you've said. Um, at first, I was teaching for the BYU Honors Department, and then I've moved over to the English Department um, and I've taught here for a number of years. My class that I really love teaching is the literature of the LDS people, and we do a section on the Book of Mormon as literature. What does uh, that mean, Book of Mormon as literature? What does that mean? Yeah, yeah, some people get a little worried about that phrasing. Um, and it by no means is insinuating that I think the Book of Mormon is fiction. That's not no, what it means at all. No. It means that we, we look at uh, the Book of Mormon from a literary perspective. So we're looking at stories. We're looking at uh, rhetoric. Um, you know, look at the plot. Look at the characters. Um, and it's just kind of a different approach to studying the Book of Mormon. You know, it's interesting because, you know, having grown up in the church, I guess since the time I was old enough to see a picture and recognize a picture, when we think of the Book of Mormon as children, and I guess kind of keep it in our mind till then, we think of Nephi, we think of 2,000 stripling warriors, we think of the title of liberty, and we all want to be Nephites. Alma, I think, kind of gives us a different view of what that means, doesn't it? Yeah, you know, he really does. Um, I think we, we've kind of developed a stereotype over time in the church, and we've perpetuated it to the point where sometimes we don't, we're not really reading the words. Yeah. Um, because I, I'm not sure that that stereotype holds true. There's at least as much, and I think a lot more evidence, to read Alma in a different way not as kind of a teenage rabble rouser, you know, this rebel without a cause. And, and, and don't get me wrong, a, a rebellious teenager can be heartbreaking, absolutely heartbreaking for parents. But I think this story is a lot more serious than that. I think there's good reason to believe that Alma's much older and much more wicked than we may have recognized previously. And, and, and the people, um, what in, in, in reading Alma, don't you also get a feeling that, the, that much of the Nephite nation and the Lamanite nation 
you can't classify one as righteous and the other is not righteous. There's a no. lot of things of the Lamanites that we really ought to think we'd like to be that too, not just the Nephites. Yeah, yeah. And some of the other speakers that you've had on have already made that point and made it so well. Um, yeah. You know, Jacob, the book of Jacob with Deirdre Green, there's so much there that says, you better take another look at this. This is this is a story, but somebody got to write the story. And we we tend to write things from our own point of view. Sure. And there's a lot of things. Well, you know, it was funny, actually, Larry, when you just mentioned your heroes, you said, uh, you know, Nephi, we all want to be like Nephi and the 2000 stripling warriors who are Lamanites. Yeah. So really, you mean they weren't Nephites? Oh, no, no, <laughs> no. And, and throughout the book, it's constantly yeah. changing. It is. Um, who who is on this side and who's on that side? it becomes more of a title. We tend to think of it as an ethnic type of uh, label. Right. Instead of one family. One family split into groups. Right. And Alma, you know, I was interested in your comment that, that Alma was not a teenager. That, that from what we are able to discern, he was an adult man doing some really bad things. In fact, I think in some ways, they were so bad, he didn't even want to let us know exactly what they were. Yeah. And and the, and reading in between the lines there, it's hard to tell if it's Alma who's worried about that or if it's Mormon who's the worried writer. about yeah. that. Yeah. But, um, you know, we, we spend so much time and space in Alma 1 to Alma 45. It's this huge book. It's hard to get through. Um I, I was laughing. I was thinking, you know, if you read one chapter a day with your family, you've got over a month with Alma yeah. 1 through 45. Yeah, a month and a half. Yeah. But that's only 19 years in the Book of Mormon. So yeah. Yeah. the part of his life that we think we know are only the last 19 years of his life. He seems to me in those 19 years to carry that burden with him in, in spite of the miraculous vision, in spite of his obviously heart-rending conversion and what he went through in those days on his knees. And, and he, he still seems to carry the burden of those earlier years with him for the, for the whole 19 years. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's what, what changed it for me. Once I sort of saw him as an older person, um, I mean, really, I think in our minds, we're thinking 15 or 16 when he's converted. That is hard to sustain given the timing that we have in the Book of Mormon. I think it's very easily in his 20s, 30s, 40s, and conceivably 50s. Um, if we look at the end of Mosiah, we have the only time in the Book of Mormon when we have someone's age at death. It's the only time we have this information. Mm. So we not only have to account for the fact that of the information, what it says, but we also have to account for the fact that we have it right here for the only time. Someone's right. kind of saying, hey, notice this. And his dad and Mosiah die on the, at the first year of the reign of the judges, the same year that Alma takes, uh, becomes chief judge. And his Mosiah dies when he's 63 years old. And Alma Sr. dies when he's 82 years old. Mm. So some amount of time has passed between the conversion and the first year of the reign of the judges, but not that much. So how old? is the son of an 82 year old father. Yeah, that's interesting. Which, and, which I'm sorry. Oh, I'm no, sorry. But, no, but no. I, I'm getting Go back ahead. to your question. You asked about the people. Yeah. So these people who are around him, they've known him years longer as a rebellious person, as an unbeliever much longer than 
as a repentant person that we think we know. So remember, it reminds me of Paul who persecuted the saints, uh, goes off to Damascus, has the great vision of Christ, and then goes, stays there for three years and comes back. And they don't really like him all that much. Yeah. And they're suspicious. And so they send him, Peter sends him to Antioch for 10 years. He's never really accepted. And I get that feeling with Alma that in spite of the great things he's done and, it, the, and the Lord asks him to do, he still seems a little bit like an outsider because of they knew him as an adult, not just as a kid. Yeah, I think so. I think it really um, shapes how we read the rest of this book. Things look different if you think older person who not teenage rebel, more about hating your parents than uh, about a belief. If you think this person was an unbeliever, there were things, distinct things that he believed and was fighting against the church of God about. Flip flop. And people might not be ready to accept that change. We that, want to, we want to believe in repentance, but that's going to be a hard one for us to believe. It's reminiscent of uh, the early church and uh, David Patton, I think it was, who came back many, many years later. And even though he came back when it was very repentant, there was a lot of anger that still existed there. It's not, it's a hard way to look at repentance. Yeah. I, and it's more about us and our ability to forgive than it is about his repentance was real. He wonderfully changed, real. Wonderfully real. This is such good news that someone who was as bad as he was, who believed what he did, could change. That's amazing. That is the gospel. See, isn't that such a, in a sense, for us reading it, as opposed to the neighbors, for us reading it, it tells us no one is beyond the Savior's redemption. And that's, that is the news of the gospel. Yeah. Whether you're, you know, whether you're a teenager or someone as old as you and me with grandkids, you can change. This is the truth. This is the message of the gospel. But whether your neighbors will let you change. Can the word the... change to you? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The Lord can change to you, but can the word change to you? Exactly. The Lord remembers no more. Yeah. And we as readers turn the page and maybe we don't remember anymore. But the people who are living with them, they did. And with, And I think as we read that, isn't it possible that some of the some of those who he is teaching who are so against the church were really friends and associates and so forth of his in this before this 19 years and that's part of their their bitterness at him too i think so i i think there's evidence for that um it's a it's like i said it's a different way to read but it explains a lot of of interesting things um, you know, you have the first year of the reign of the judges and the very first thing that happens is that Nehor shows up and, you know, he knows he's, he's been around too much. He has to know the law. He know that he knows that Alma has the authority to condemn him and he shows up and it, the, the scripture says that he pleads for himself with much boldness so we, we step back and we say, why? What's going on here? Why would he plead for himself with much boldness? Why would he wear fancy clothes when he knows that people in the church reject that? Shows up in front of Alma and is so bold and brash. But then we look carefully at what the, the few little hints that we have about what he's preaching. And they look remarkably like unbeliever philosophies. So what are the chances if he has these same kind of philosophies 
that Alma had only a few years before. Right. And they're both in Zarahemla, that they'd never encountered each other, that they didn't at least know about each other. And so when he shows up in the very first year of the reign of the judges and says, really, Alma, you're going to condemn me for preaching what you were saying not that many years ago? Okay. You know, yeah. and he's, he yeah. is bitter till the very end. He does not recant. He does not step away from just this hostility, which doesn't make any sense. If Alma had a little teenage moment, right, and lived the next thirty years, love in lovely bliss with the church, yeah. and and then it gets worse. Then it gets worse. By the way, I was wrong. It wasn't David Patton. I'm trying to think of who the member of the quorum was that went to Salt Lake months later. Someone might remember that. <clears throat> and Brigham Young was pretty tough on him in the general conference. So, if someone on the sidebar here can get Tell me the right name, I'd appreciate it. But back on, uh, but back on, uh, uh, you know, Nehor, there just seems to be several of these people who really make it tough for Alma on either side. Yeah. Um, you know, they, they really do. Um, and I, I focused in on Alma and Iha in the book. Right. Because I think that is just this critical changing moment for Alma and for this whole situation. He, you know, he shows up in Ammonihah. And, and the first thing they say is, you know, we know who you are. Yeah. And we don't care who you are. We don't care that you were chief judge of this whole land just barely a year ago. Get out. And they throw him out. That, by the way, that, that's reminiscent of Moses, who spent his entire life having to live down, and having grown up uh, in ease while they were up to their feet in mud. Um, yeah. It, it, just because the Lord has a mission for you doesn't mean the people appreciate you personally. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, and especially... Continue on Ammonihah, though. That, Let's let's focus there. Yeah. 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 I, I think there's there's hints. You know, we don't know. We don't know for sure, but we do know that they are after the order of Nehor. It says that they that's what they believe in. And then if you comb through, you know, what they're saying, again, these beliefs look surprisingly like what the unbelievers believed, um, which is kind of hard to say. <laughs> unbelievers yeah. beliefs yeah, of course. but but the the thing is we we know straight up alma was an unbeliever he was numbered among the unbelievers and we actually just have to go back one chapter and in original chaptering though the, the uh, mosiah 26 and 27 were put together it was the same story um so those unbelievers in mosiah 26 and it's spelled out pretty well what they believe they don't believe in the traditions of their fathers. They don't believe that Christ will come. They have a serious concern with the resurrection for the dead. Um, they believe in persecuting people. And, you know, there's seven or eight beliefs in there. And as you go through the book of Alma, these same ideas, you know, twisted a little this way, twisted a little that way. But the same ideas just keep coming up over and over and over again. And they very much do in Ammonihah as well. These people are, you know, like I said, little twists here and there. But they have the same concerns about resurrection for the dead, about a Christ being, and, and the, all the Antichrists. In fact, all the Antichrists in the Book of Mormon, except for Sherem, show up right here in the first few years of the reign of the judges. And you kind of have to say, why? Why here? Why now? They, it, it seems fairly likely that, uh, that, they're, that, that they are facing, that he is facing, people that they already know. Yeah. That these are not strangers that all of a sudden come into their midst. And that's, that's so fascinating. If you, if you slow down 
and read the Book of Mormon carefully and don't just skip over the names and the places and everything like that. Um, you notice little things, really little things. Like he leaves, he's going on his missionary journeys and he goes from Melech to Ammonihah. That's the three days from Melech to Ammonihah. And then out of the whole Book of Mormon, we have to take this moment for Mormon or someone to tell us that was the custom of the Nephi, uh, the people of Nephi to name their villages and their towns and their small villages to name everything after the person who settled them. And thus it was with Ammonihah. But there's no Ammonihah in the whole book. There's no one named that. Mm. We do know there's an Ammon. And the strange thing is, Right. When Alma gets kicked out the first time from the city of Ammonihah, he's headed to the city of Aaron. So, you know, no one says it. But there's little hints that Ammon, a city of Ammonihah next to Aaron. We don't know, but could they be, could those cities have been settled by Ammon and Aaron? and people who know them, possibly. You know, looking at, at some of the messages there, one, one of the messages to me, how firmly do we believe today that Christ is going to return? If you were to take the world or narrow it down to the United States or narrow it down to Western US or whatever, and ask people to raise their hand. How many people in our day and age, just like in Alma's time, actually believe that Jesus the Christ will himself in person return to this earth and will then usher in the millennium? Yeah, yeah, I think um, sometimes in my class, just as a practice for uh, analysis, learning how to analyze something. We just do a simple breakdown of the Book of Mormon of how many years are spent per page. And when you do it like that, you see that the Book of Alma, I'm not a big surprise, is <laughs> we have a, a huge number of pages for only a few years. In fact, it's it's pretty obvious that the Book of Mormon is focused on this time period before Christ comes. And it seems it seems pretty clear right. to me that that there's a reason for this focus on this time period. And as you're saying, you know, maybe even the same sort of unbeliefs, a rejection of the gospel of Jesus Christ could be coming through in this time. Uh don't you think also maybe, I, I, when I read scripture, I always sort of ask two questions. One, why did it happen? And the second is, why did the person who wrote this down find that this was so important that they were going to put it in the book? So the, it would seem to me that Mormon had a, had a, uh, a sense that this period leading up to the uh, arrival of the, uh, of the Savior, was so important that he really put a lot of emphasis, he really compiled a lot of what was done there. Uh, Alma chapter five always seemed to me to be sort of the final exam. You know, this is the question we're going to be asked on a final exam. Where does yes. that fit in your view of Alma? Well, it is a brilliant sermon. It, there's, there's so many questions. I mean, it's just rhetorically speaking, it's magnificent. There's other people multiple people who've studied that sermon and many of them say you know clearly the most brilliant sermon well king benjamin's is so good too yeah. but brilliant rhetorically speaking in the book of mormon and and it's holding its own against the bible or anywhere else yeah. but when i read it i can't help but notice the last few verses there in alma 5 where he's warning the people um, about the good shepherd does call you after you. If you'll hearken unto his voice, he will bring you into his fold. And ye are his sheep, and he commandeth you 
that ye suffer no ravenous wolf to enter among you, that you may not be destroyed. And every time I read that, I think, you know, how could he, he knows what he's saying and he knows what at least some of the people are probably thinking. You're talking about yourself. <laughs> And I think Alma was asking himself those questions along with asking everyone else the question. And uh, yeah. they kind of, I don't know about you, but when I read those questions, I think if that's the final exam, I, I, I get an F um, oh. in my own mind. And then I think, no, no, A Alma teaches us that God will bring us forward, that the Savior's atonement will bring us forward. Yeah. And on that basis, yeah, it, that, if Alma mattered to God, then so do I. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because I, I, as you were mentioning, and I go into it in the book, um, he was that bad. Yeah. He was that bad. It run out of chances kind of bad. Uh-oh. <laughs> oh, well, having a little fun with pictures here. <laughs> that was exciting. <laughs> yeah. Um, what would be your, your biggest takeaway from the last part of Alma's mission and why he finally decides I'm done being the chief judge? I'm done. Yeah. So he, he, he quits being the chief judge Yeah. and just goes on a mission to try to uh, bear down in testimony, which is funny. It, the wording matches what Nehor said he was doing. They're both bearing down. Yeah. Um, and and so in a sense, that phrasing tells us he's trying to counteract all these antichrists, and he's not. He feels like he's not able to do that as a chief judge. He just needs to go bear testimony of Christ. To the people and so he goes off on this multi-year mission um over the same time period actually that the sons of of mosiah are off on their mission sure um and he just preaches but then ammonihah happens and i think that is so devastating and destructive for him even possibly traumatizing for him that we lose track of him for a while. Explain and, that a little bit. Well, we kind of don't notice because we have Ammon and, you know, Aaron and these exciting stories with the anti Nephi Lehi's. So you kind of forget that, and, and if we don't pay attention to the years, you don't notice that we haven't heard anything from Alma in quite a while. Um, and then most people just assume that he shows back up as the author of Alma 29. But we actually don't know that. We don't know for sure that he re is speaking publicly until uh, Alma 31, which is out of my book. But I did yeah. go ahead and <laughs> talk about that part, you know, and until he goes to the Zoramites. We lose track of him for a number of years. He's not in, he's not publicly speaking. And we know he's doing some things. There's a few illusions. I mean, he goes to find Zeezrom um, and preaches with him for a little while. And then Amulek and Zeezrom are preaching. Um, but he goes pretty quiet, especially compared to what we've just heard from him. Significant sermons, amazing. Uh, life-changing kind of Alma 5 sermons and then nothing and you know it's speculative a little bit but I think he's coping with what happened at Ammonihah right it's it's too harsh we said that we, we sometimes just sort of gloss over that yeah they threw people in the fire and so forth well, you know, but this and, is and, human. This is human. This is real. This this happened. And this this happened in front of him. This happened. It's it's almost mind boggling. Yeah. And it, it, it is written in a way that we're meant to focus on the miracle of them walking out of the prison. And it says that they're not harmed, but I think they definitely are harmed. Emotionally. 
emotionally at very least. Yeah. Um, but what happens there in Ammonihah with the fire, it's, it is horrific. It yeah. is so personal. It is so, when you go back and read it carefully, you just think, what is going on here? These people are constantly overreacting. And I mean, Alma gets wound up too. And he's saying, you know, if you don't repent, your torment will be as a lake of fire and brimstone. And they're saying, okay, we're, you know, but everything they do is, is just over the top. They escalate. They escalate. Seriously escalate, but not in small not steps. Not incrementally. No. Not incrementally. In fact, it's we just have like they blow up. no words at all from Alma. And the first thing they say is, we know who you are. Who? Well, actually, they say it as a question. Who are you? And then they say, and who is God? Get out. Yeah. Yeah. In a sense, it's who are you to be here? Not just who are you, but who are you to be here and try and tell us what we yeah. ought to be doing? Exactly. And that's what it feels like to me. That's what it seems like to me when I read it. Um, and don't then, you, don't you get the feeling that, that, in a sense, that's why he leaves being chief judge by saying, you know, I can only do a limited amount of good by doing this. I, well, until people change their hearts, their actions that get judged by the law are not going to matter. Yeah. He tried. He, he tried to do good there, and he was serving as, uh, you know, the high priest of the church at the same time, which had to be a heavy load. But then he just said, missionary work, that is where it's at. I, I need to go preach to these people. I need to try to save them because, remember, he led many of them, many of them astray. Um, and, and in my opinion, that's what he's doing. His last 19 years of his life, he is trying to reclaim the people to fix the problem that he created in large measure. He is the one who led so many of them astray that an angel of the Lord comes to tell him, stop it. And not stop it or I'm going to get mad at you. Stop it. Stop it now. Yeah, in fact, when I... When I, when I read that account, it, it sounds to me like what the angel is saying, you do with your life what you're going to do, but you stepped over the line. You stepped over the line when you determined to destroy the church. Yeah, yeah, and that's how I, that's how I read it too. And I played with the punctuation a little, which is, I don't know how people are going to feel about that, but I explained why. And that's because the Book of Mormon, when it was translated by the gift and power of God, it was just very little, a few proper nouns are capitalized, but very little punctuation, just huge, long lists of words, uh, which was then punctuated at the Grand Imprint Shop um, by John Gilbert, who did an amazing job. I always, I've tried multiple times to try to do the punctuation myself in a few of the chapters and it is very difficult and he did much of it on the fly while while typesetting which is backwards and you know anyway he did a great job but i think the punctuation in when the angel's speaking which we have told to us a couple different times it, it doesn't really make sense um, and a lot of people have come up with a lot of different explanations, but actually just a few little punctuation changes uh, make it make perfect sense. Yeah, yeah, yeah. commas in the wrong place mm -hmm. change the whole meaning. Changes the whole meaning. Yeah. Uh, we've got some questions here. Um, Great. <laughs> I hope you people were nice to me. <laughs> Question number one, how could you let Larry East, no, that's not the question there, I'm sorry. How can each of us in the audience today do what you do? How did you find all these beautiful moving ideas within the text? What a great question. Um, slow down, 
read carefully. I am, I do not have some background in, I don't have a PhD. Ah, I think I'm the only one on the team, but that this is a good thing because it means any of you can do what I do and slow down. And the other thing I would say is ask questions. I know we want to bring our huge life questions to the text, but I, I, my experience is if you bring textual questions, uh, what does this word mean? Why are we told here the date of Alma Senior's death? That's weird. Have I ever read that in the Book of Mormon before? The more questions you can ask the text itself, the more things start to open up to you. And that's what's been life-changing to me. Um, yes, I know people who've had amazing experiences with some pressing issue on their mind. Um, and they can open the book and miraculously have the answer right there. That doesn't happen to me. Yeah. And maybe it's because Heavenly Father is saying, you know how to read, you're going to study this. But it's been as I study slowly, carefully over the years that I've just found my life changed. That's reminiscent of the of the Jewish mother who, when her children came home from the synagogue, would say, would not ask, what did you learn today? She would ask, what what good questions did you ask today? I actually have my my students in my class keep a question journal instead of a response journal, because I that's, they need to learn to read carefully. And I, I tell them they can get all the questions, 20 questions per reading of one verse if they want easily. Sure. By the way, I have a bucket list of questions I want to ask when I get on the other side. Just keep them, keep them there. <laughs> yeah. Could you please provide some context for the converted men of Ammonihah having to leave the city, but leaving their wives and children behind to face the fire? Yeah, this is, it's a strange, strange story. And like we said, it's so, so troubling. It's so deeply troubling. The, what happens there, as far as I can tell, is the people are the people of Ammonihah are purposely, purposefully vindictive and mean, and they are using Alma and Amulek's words against them. So Amulek speaks at one point in time and says, if they cast the righteous out from among them, God will destroy them. And Alma also says the same thing. If you don't repent, then... The, it will be as if you're suffering in a lake of fire and brimstone. And so the people say, really? This is how much we believe in your God. You say, we can't cast the righteous out or we'll be destroyed. We'll do that, Amulek. How do you like that? Yeah. yeah. And then and the day that that dawned on me, speaking of kids coming home from school, they, my kids come home from school on a regular basis for a couple of years there. And I'd be sitting at my desk with tears streaming down my face. And they just would walk in and say, oh, Alma again, what'd you find today, mom? And I would say, you know, something like, the people did that on purpose. They built in a order, lake. In order to hurt. In order to hurt him. Yeah. They built a lake of fire, just an unfortunate metaphor. One that's been used multiple times. This is how we say, um, you're going to suffer, and there'll be the pains sure. of hell if sure. you don't repent. Nephi said it. Jacob said it. King Benjamin said it. Alma uses the same metaphor, and they say, great idea. We will build a lake of fire and brimstone, and we will make you watch it. And suffer. We will we'll bring Amulek, your great friend, and make him watch it too possibly seeing his own wife and children burned. And then we're going to walk up to you, make sure you understand that it was your words that caused this, that created this situation. 
you 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 draw attention to Abby. Yeah. What is there about that story? Well, first of all, you can't help but be intrigued by this woman who actually gets a name in the Book of Mormon. Yes. It's amazing. There's only six women, six women who are named. And the whole um, book. three of them. Three of them are just biblical. And so here we have Abish. Um, and she just seems to be such a marginalized person. I mean, she's a servant. She's Lamanite-ish, which we don't know what that means. Um, she's a woman. And, and yet she has this name and she acts. She steps forward and, and has been converted which of course is very interesting phrasing. We can't really tell if she was converted on an account of her father's vision or if she had a vision of her father. We're not sure because the phrasing is a little bit strange, sure. but then she gathers people around and makes a critical difference in this story about Ammon and King Ramoni. Um, it's fascinating. Yes. How do you relate to her? Uh, well, um, the thing that, that I'm going to, that I propose in the book, and this is, this again is very speculative, but as I was reading, there's some phrasing in here that just caught me all of a sudden. And I realized that this couple verses of what she said, all you have to do is switch the pronouns and it's in first person. Um, and which just took me aback. And there are reasons for, you know, for me to propose this. But if you stand back and, and suddenly read it as she has a name, I, Abish, having been converted unto the Lord for many years on account of a remarkable vision of my father. Thus, having been converted to the Lord and having made it known, therefore, when I saw that all the servants of Lamoni, and she goes on, and it occurred to me that we could be hearing her voice. There are places in, in, it's in Helaman 3 and a number of other places that tells us we don't have all the records. We don't at all. And in Helaman 3, it clarifies that in particular, the anti-Nephi Lehi's were very prolific. They had lots of records. It's, it's speculative, but it seems possible that we have a little bit of an anti-Nephi-Lehi record right here in Alma 19. Yeah, the, 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 we don't know what was going through Mormon's mind, whether he collapsed things together in order to get more story together, more information together in shorter space, or whether uh, everything happened exactly like that. Yeah. Uh, Here's a really interesting question. How old was Alma II when his father, Alma, Alma I, uh, was the priest of King Noah? Is it possible to discuss without too much speculation, is it possible that the culture of King Noah's priests influenced Alma the Younger's rebellion? Yeah. Yeah, that's intriguing. Um, we're told that he's numbered among the unbelievers. And those unbelievers are the children, the young children from King Benjamin's sermon who weren't old enough to understand what was going on. So that's the culture that he's stepping into. And yet they do have some things in common with King Noah's uh, priests that we have no idea when Alma was born. I will tell you the only thing I found and someone is so welcome to help me find anything else the only thing that I found that even gives us a clue maybe about when Alma 
might have been born or how old he was is in Alma 5, your favorite chapter. Um, and it's a, just a tiny little pronoun switch. Well, Alma 5.5 5 says, talking of Alma Sr. And, and that group of people, they were brought into bondage by the hands of the Lamanites in the wilderness. Yea, I say unto you, they were in captivity. And again, the Lord did deliver them out of bondage by the power of his words. And we were brought into this land. And here we began to establish the church of God. So right in the middle of that little verse, he switches from talking about his dad and family members as they to we. So I don't know when is the time you start to self-identify with your family. I mean, I when we were talking earlier, when we first signed on, we were talking about um, where I was born in Idaho, and I was saying that my parents were there. And this is an example of that. When do I say, oh, and then my family moved to Cody, Wyoming, and that's where I grew up. You know, when that's the only thing I can find that might even hint for us when Alma was born. As you read his mighty change of heart sermon, what impresses you most about his teachings in this sermon and how we can continue to feel that this, this as this uh, person puts it, the song of redeeming love. Yeah. I love that phrase, by the way. Yeah. Yeah, that is so beautiful. Um, you know, I think one thing that impresses me and that I think is a really powerful tool is remembering. And all through the Book of Mormon, we get this command to remember. And Alma does it impeccably. The angel said to remember the past, remember his fathers. And in every public speech we have, he does specifically go back. He's fo he follows that obediently, religiously. So how can we continue to experience this? You remember. He remembers what he came from. And that is hard. But he yeah, also remembers then the grace of God constantly. Don't we also kind of also need to sort of think of ourselves as Alma one of Alma Sr. and never giving up on his sons, never giving up, praying always. He understood that, though, you know, he was a priest of King Noah. Yeah. He understood what, what was, of all people, he had compassion on his son. Um, he understood the allure of what King Noah is priests were preaching and how it how it could deceive and draw people away well and but i think for most of us uh in life and uh, we it doesn't matter your age you continue to pray for your children yeah yeah absolutely and i'm sure that's another powerful uh way to keep you humble and connected with god we don't want those hard situations. We would rather everything be smooth and coasting along nicely. But when things are hard, when kids stray, you remember, you remember God and you remember who you turn to in those hard times. And you raise your kids to be independent and darn, they become independent. <laughs> I know. I tell my husband that too. And I, did we tell them? Because I never would have said that to my parents, never. <laughs> Did we tell them we wanted to know their opinions on everything? Because they share them. <laughs> and yet Al Alma, and I and I, I love Alma, I love, I love the chapter five because I think these are essential questions that uh, we need to continually remind ourselves of. But yeah. that's leading up to, and I think 
the questions that he asks, he knows the arrival of the Savior is imminent. And he doesn't know the day or the hour, but he knows it's imminent. And I think he wants to put those questions out there and have those in front of the people on a daily basis as they, as, as the nation slowly comes to the arrival of the Savior himself. He does. And it's in Alma 7 in Gideon. He's preaching in Gideon where he says that. He tells us, there is one thing which is of more importance than they all, than all of those things. Here's the most important thing that the time is not far distant, that the Redeemer liveth and cometh among his people. So if we're seeing that our times are mirroring these times, we might want to pay attention to Alma 7.7. 7. We're hearing a lot about that right now in general conference. And so I think this last general conference, I heard more discussion from the pulpit on uh, the return of the Savior and on turning that to the Savior than I have in a long time. Yeah. Yep. Doubt not, fear not. Keep your mind. Tell us a little bit about your about the book itself and how long it took you and when when can we expect it to be published? <laughs> it's at the printers right oh, now. Oh, good. <laughs> So I, I'm not positive. I see comments on the side. So Blair's there. He, and, and they can, Maxwell Institute probably has a better estimate of judging when it will be coming out, I think, in within a week or two. Um, the book itself. Well, first of all, I didn't try why, for... Why Alma? Why well, Alma? I've been studying Alma for years, really. Um, I don't know. He got under my skin. And, you know, I think it first started when I was reading beside my dad's bedside as he was dying. And I just suddenly noticed some connections between what he's saying and what King Benjamin was saying. And it just caught me off guard. And I know so many of you probably already have read that and studied it and know, but it just caught me. And I thought, why, why are you quoting King Benjamin's sermon that leads his people into this dramatic, born again, life changing experience for King Benjamin's people? And you're, you're quoting him at Ammonihah to the worst, some of the worst people in the Book of Mormon. What's going on here? And it just caught my attention, and I just couldn't, haven't been able to get rid of it ever since. Um, my kids say I have a scripture crush on Alma. Well, if you're going to have one, that's a good one to have. Yeah. Uh, you know, you, you again. I go back to. Uh, I'm, I'm particularly partial to Paul, and I go back to Paul's writing in, in uh, where he says, if God before us, who can be against us? And I kind of feel that in Alma, that in spite of both sides, one in a positive, but one in a negative, having problems with Alma, Alma knew his mission. Yeah. He knew his mission. And he didn't let anything, including just really horrible things, get in the way of him doing what he knew his father in heaven wanted him to do. And he did. And yet along the way, he was sad and it was hard. And he expressed that. He, you know, he says, how long? God, how long do I have to stay here and, and keep seeing these people, keep dealing with these problems, keep watching my people, my own son, Corey Anton, have the same questions that I used to have. Yeah. And I think recognizing that he said that, that, that Nephi lamented, that Alma lamented, that lets us know there is a place to have a hard time to struggle and say, 
why? Why, is the, why does this keep happening, God? It's okay. God listened. And sometimes, <clears throat> I know Spencer W. Kimball's, um, in his book, a chapter on, uh, uh, on, on why things happen. And uh, Spencer Kim, W. Kimball, I just, I, I love that, the, the chapter on tragedy or destiny. At one point, he points to all terrible things that have happened, and he said, if you can answer why they happen, fine, but I cannot. Yeah. But this I know. And then he bears a testimony of why we're here and why we go through what we go through. And I get that feeling from Alma that while Alma can't reconcile everything throughout, Alma has a testimony. And while he, the human, has failings, he, the prophet, he, the chief priest, cannot. And so in the end, that's where he puts his life. Yeah. And, and just to, to add into that a little bit, I think that what we can learn from him, one of the big things to learn from him is asking some of these hard questions, asking why, asking how long is this trial going to last? That's not a faithless question. You're asking God why. This means that at the bottom of it, you have faith that he might have an answer and asking it again if you don't find an answer means you still have faith that he's there um that's i think that's one of the beautiful lessons that we can learn from him that that's okay make space for yourself and for other people to ask some of those hard questions it's okay you know, I think um, there, there are some, I, I believe that the scripture, instead of saying endure to the end, I'll just say enjoy to the end. But there are some times when it truly is endure. Yeah. And uh, as we always used to say in the Marine Corps, continue to march. And I yeah. think there are some times that we see Alma where it's just continue to march. Yeah. You know. And, and it gets that hard. Yeah. <clears throat> You know, you've been terrific. Thank you for sharing an hour with us. You're so Thank kind you. to do that. Take your time. What final I, thoughts do you have? Um, read the book. <laughs> I see there's a lot more questions. I'll, I'll look at those questions. And I don't mean read my book, by the way. I mean, read the scriptures. The um, so if you... I'll look at those questions and try to get back to you and answer them if I can. Um, and, but the same thing applies. If you have questions about my book, great. Do question me. That's fine. You think Alma's younger and a teenager? Fine. Great. Find it in the scriptures. Read it from there. That's my last message. You know, we had some really good questions come up in this and appreciate those. Uh, we'll replay this session. It'll be available on the Woodso Foundation YouTube channel later this week. So for those of your friends and associates who didn't get to hear this, uh, it will be available. Our next conversation will be on October 18th at 2 p.m. Pacific with Mark Rethoff, author of the series volume on Alma 30 through 63, with Chris Eastland from the, uh, on the board of the Johnny Woodso Foundation. Uh, the reason it will be at two o'clock is because Mark is in London and that's, I think, about 9 p.m. in London. So I think he didn't want to go at four or five in the morning. So it'll be at two o'clock. Also, just a, as an alert, on November 1st, we have a very special um, series to begin. Uh, Audrey Kitagawa, who is the chairman of the Parliament of the World's Religions, and Dean Baronsani, who is the vice provost at the University of Southern California, and I will be discussing great issues of the world and where the, what the role of the religious community is in helping to resolve some of those issues. So that will be on November 1st. Um, I sure enjoyed this. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank, Thank you. you. It's been a pleasure. Thank you. 
And thanks to all of you for being with us too. We appreciate you and uh, we love having the opportunity to be a part of your life for this hour. Thank you. Thank you.